by golly, what do we have here? A collection of cars. Here's a uh, group of uh, small cars, foreign cars and uh, small American compacts. Over here is a collection of much heavier cars. These are station wagons and small pickup trucks. Here's a station wagon, not unlike the one I rumble around in at home. And backstage here, there's a whole group of uh, sort of standard uh, sedans, six and eight cylinder sedans, such as, you know, you're likely to run into or, or pass by on uh, any highway or street. Our purpose now in looking at all these cars is to contemplate the problem associated with determining whether or not uh, two uh, kinds of gasoline uh, determine their performances in these cars. For example, suppose you had an additive that you wanted to place in one of the, in one of the, in the gasolines, and it was your premise that the additive did indeed increase the performance of the uh, cars, it added more miles per gallon. How would you design such an experiment? Well, the, the one way to design the experiment would be to be sure that all the light cars and all the six-cylinder cars and so forth were put on the gasoline with the additive, and all the other cars were put on gasoline without additive, and uh, by gum, if you were to run that experiment, I'll wager you could show that those two averages were in fact really different. The average performance for the light cars versus the average performance for the heavy cars. Uh, that would indeed suggest perhaps that uh, the gasoline with additive was better than the gasoline without additive. Uh, statisticians have a formal name for that kind of experimental design. We call that cheating. Now, really, our interest is to make inferences about the two kinds of gasoline across, uh, you know, all the sorts of cars we're likely to run into in the standard experience. And we have such a collection here uh, before us. Now, how might we design an experiment? Not only do we have the differences between cars to worry about, but we have heavy-footed drivers and light-footed drivers. And then we have such problems as some people live uh, to go home, they have to run over and down hills, and other people have highways, and it's very flat to their houses, and we have weather differences, and what have you. There are lots and lots of things which can, can contribute to the variability of the experiment. So what we'd like to do is run an experiment which, in a sense, was protected against all these slings and arrows of uh, outrageous fortune, and get a bit of evidence relative to the true difference between the mean performance for gasoline one and the mean performance for gasoline two, gasoline one being the one with the additive. How would you design such an experiment to protect it against all these vagaries of things which can impinge on the experiment? Some we can't even name, perhaps. It might happen while the experimental program was on. The method we use is the method of randomization. Some aspect of randomization attaches itself to every experiment. And so I'm going to run an experiment in which I randomize my trials. Now, I'll wager a lot of you have seen magicians pull rabbits out of a hat, but I bet you this is the first time you've seen a statistician pull cars out of a hat. I'm going to run an experiment to check whether an additive in the gasoline does, in fact, increase performance. And I'm, I do know enough to put 10 cars on one side and 10 cars on the other, one trial on the other. I have 20 cars here, and so I'm going to draw them randomly. That car is going to go on gasoline with additive, that one without. Uh, that one with, that one without. That one with, and this one without. And you know, even as I draw these cars out of the hat, I can uh, quickly feel the differences in their weights, just incidentally. And so it is. I'm going to have these tw 20 cars spread out here. Some are going to be used on gasoline one, and some are going to be used on gasoline two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cars on each side. Okay, let's imagine that such an experiment was run. We empty the gas tanks, we give them each five gallons of gas, give them each five gallons of gas, and then we uh, ask the uh, individuals to drive their car around, recording the number of miles they get for that five gallons of gas. And let's take a look at what the uh, mileage performance has been uh, for the two types of gasoline. And we see such a numerical record right here. A note for uh, car one and uh, gasoline one, he got 74.0 miles. But car two uh, for gasoline uh, uh, one got 68.8 miles. And you can see the variation between the gas records there for the 20 separate cars. Okay, let's, uh, although we've looked over these data and there are no aberrant observations that we can detect, let's get the essential statistics out of these data and uh, record them and see what we can do. I have here on the board, uh, there are 10 observations in both the treatments. Uh, 
treatments. The treatments being the two uh, times the gasoline. Here are the two averages. The average for the additive gas was something slightly more than the average for the non-additive gas. Here are the two estimates of the variance that you see over here with nine degrees of freedom. We have uh, pooled the estimates of the variance together. Here's the familiar equation for pooling. We've taken the S squares and multiplied them up by the degrees of freedom, getting the corrected sums of squares for each classification, summed them up and divided down by the total degrees of freedom. Finally, our estimate of S squared pool turns out to be uh, 6.176, and that has 18 degrees of freedom. 18 because there are nine degrees of freedom in both these other estimates. Okay, gang, let's also do this calculation quickly now doing the analysis of variance. And so I come to the analysis of variance table here. You'll remember that every analysis of variance starts out with a mathematical model, and my model is a simple and familiar one. Each observation is equal to the mean performance across all automobiles, if you will, plus the kick you get for being in one treatment or another, plus the kick you get for either having the gasoline with the additive or having the gasoline without the additive. That's what the tau sub j's are, plus other sources of variability, such as cars and heavy-footed drivers and rainy days and hilly roads, what have you. We assume that if you composite all those errors, they tend to have a normal distribution with mean zero and a fixed variance sigma squared. I've set out the analysis of variance table here. This is the corrected sum of squares of all those observations you saw earlier. It has 19 degrees of freedom. There are 20 observations, and of course we lost one when we took out the correction factor. And here's the treatment sum of squares. There are two ways, you remember, of getting the treatment sum of squares. Actually, estimate the treatment effects and then take all their sums of squares. It'd be 20 little taus for the first gasoline, or 10 little taus for the first gasoline, and 10 different taus for the second gasoline take their sum of squares. Or you could use that quick calculation formula we've showed you for treatment sum of squares. That's 0 0.8405, not very much is being absorbed by treatment differences apparently. That cost me one degree of freedom. There are two treatments, but only one degree of freedom is consumed. And my residual sum of squares is as you see it here with 18 degrees of freedom, and if I divide degrees of freedom into the sums of squares, I get the mean square. In this case, it would be 6.1758, and the expected value of that mean squared is sigma squared, the estimate of the intrinsic variability. Okay, now the important thing is to make an interval statement for the difference between those two mean performances for those two gasolines. We could do a test of significance now. We could test the hypothesis that there was no difference in the means using an F ratio and this analysis of variance test. But much more important is to find out what do we know about the difference between eta 1 and eta 2. So let's proceed directly uh, to an interval estimation for that important parameter. So that's not difficult to do. You all recall that if we want to make an interval statement for the uh, difference between two means, uh, the limits are given by the difference between the two averages, uh, plus or minus the critical value of t times the square root of the variance of the statistic. Now our two averages were 7104 and 70.63. And let's see, that gave me a difference of 0 0.41. This is miles per, f uh, miles per five gallons, okay? And now, what do we have to do? We'll have to plug in this equation and uh, get the limits for eta 1 minus eta 2. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. Let's see. It would be uh, 0 0.41 is my statistic. Uh, the two uh, sets of uh, averages are both based on 10 observations. Quick, quick. Let's see. S squared. Where are you, S squared? 6.176. Uh, that was the estimate of the variability that we got both either way from the pooled within estimate or from the analysis of variance table. And now, by gum, what's T? R, that's the critical value of T. It leaves 2.5% in the tail of the curve. That T has um, how many degrees of freedom? That T would have 18 degrees of freedom, so I better scurry and uh, look that baby up. So let's look up T. That's 18. Dum, ba -dum, dum, 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 T with 18 is 2.10, according to this. So uh, let's find there, we are, t equals 2.10. Now if we were to turn that crank and do all that arithmetic right there, we would find out that we had 0 0.41 plus or minus 2.33, and that would provide us with the following limits for eta 1 minus eta 2. And how would I interpret this statement? These are the limits for the parameter. I'd say that all values for eta 1 minus eta 2, which lie inside these limits, are not contradicted by the data. This is a 95% confidence statement. Okay, gang. Now, this represents 
this particular represents is, is an algebraic expression. And of course, what we want to do is really get the ideas into the mind and into the imagination of the experimenter. So instead of just looking at a, a bunch of written material like this, let's actually give a geometric demonstration. And so that's not difficult to do. I have a graph here, a chart here. The observed value of the difference is 0 0.41, and the limits in this case go from minus 1.92, way down here, all the way up as high as uh, plus 2.74. And that's what I know about eta. All values of eta 1 minus eta 2, which lie inside that interval, are not contradicted by the data. Look, gang, supposing someone came to you and says, I think that eta 1 minus eta 2 is equal to 0. What's your attitude towards that suggestion? You'd say, well, golly, 0 is well within the interval. That's a value for the parameter which is not contradicted by the data. So had we done an, a test of significance on our analysis of variance table, it would have come out non-significant. We would have observed a very common ordinary F. But more important, we really see what we do know about eta 1 minus eta 2, and frankly, we don't know very much. Because the difference between those means could be negative. Adding the additive could, in fact, depress the miles per gallon, according to this data. Or, and also, it could also increase. We really don't know much about it. This brings us to a discussion about what can we do to learn more about the value of, of the true difference between those means. The best estimate is 0.41, but what could we do to get a better estimate of the true mean? What I want you to do now is consider a completely new problem. Now, we're going to use the same data, but I want you to uh, think in terms of a completely new problem. And uh, I'm going to do it as follows. Since I need 20 observations, I'm going to end up with 10 cars. So let's first of all get rid of these two cars back in our randomization hat here. I'm going to randomly draw 10 cars. There's the first one, all right? Now the trick will be with this particular car, I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to run that car on both gasolines, okay? And then I'm going to do the same for the other remaining cars. And so I'm going to have in all 10 cars randomly chosen out of this bag this hat, and um, how many more here? Three, six, nine, ten. There are ten cars. I'm going to assign uh, gas, uh, the two gasolines to each car. Now, why is that a good idea? Well, look, group, here's a, um, here's a very, uh, here's a station wagon, or here's a heavier station wagon. Here's a heavy station wagon. That will be very hard on both gasolines. The miles per gallon would be low for both gasolines. Here's a very light car and the miles per gallon there will be high for both gasolines. So if I would take both gasolines and put them on that car and look at the difference between the gasolines, and I'll take both gasolines and put them on that car and look at the difference between both gasolines, then those differences would be clear of the fact that this was a heavy car and this was a light car. We would have, in a sense, blocked out a source of variability, the source of variability being the, the weight or the size of the car. This brings us to a class of designs called the randomized block designs. How am I going to assign the gasolines to each one of these cars? I'm going to assign them randomly. Now there are two gasolines, so the easiest thing to do would be for me to assign gasoline one and gasoline two by means of tossing a coin. So all I've got to do is, um... <laughs> okay, someone in the class toss me a coin, will you please? My golly, thanks. Good. Now, to, hey, enough, enough. Uncle. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, and you won't get them back, <laughs> by golly. There we are. Now, if it turns up heads or it turns up tails, we'll determine which gasoline is used first. And my purpose in doing that is to get more randomization into the experiment. And this randomization protects me against such things as cold motors for initial trials and so on. All right, now let's imagine what the data look like that we have gotten as a consequence of running uh, this kind of an experimental program. In other words, we have 10 cars now, and we now see the data on each of the uh, 10 cars uh, displayed here. Okay, look at car A. Notice how car A is undoubtedly one of the light cars because it gave long mileages for the gasoline with and without the additive. And look at car B. That must have been one of the heavier cars because the mileage for both has been depressed. And if you go on down the deck and look at the uh, cars farther on down, you will notice that the car-to-car -car differences do, in fact, account for a great deal of the variability in that data. And look at the last two cars, for example. Car J is a light car, I suspect, and car 
I must have been a heavy car. Or car J is a car driven by a very careful driver, and car I by someone who likes to spin his wheels as starting and stopping. 